In the late 1860s, a change was brewing in the art world. For years, people had been working in a romantic style, painting figures in a more or less realistic fashion in these carefully composed landscapes fraught with all sorts of literary importance and illusion. But this was boring. A group of painters had grown frustrated with constantly painting these heroic figures in heroic landscapes and laden with these literary references. And they decided that what they really wanted to do was to get outside and paint nature. They were fascinated with light and water and the interaction of shadows and the different colors and possibilities that were available. They mixed their paint not on a palette but right on the canvas. And they concerned themselves not with presenting these sort of re semi-realistic historical things but with the way they were interpreting things. They painted shadows, different colors other than gray or black. They painted them blue and red. They created objects by stringing together blobs of color less interested in conveying reality than in making something pretty on the canvas. They stopped trying to formally compose their pictures and instead went out and painted nature and things as they actually saw them. At the time, most artists would run outside, make a quick sketch of something, and then run back inside to the safety of their studio and paint it from memory using the sketch as a reference. Of course, they were rebels and outcasts and the official French salon completely rejected their work. Renoir, Degas, Manet, and Monet earned the name Impressionists after Monet's painting Impression Sunrise. Originally intended as a put-down, they adopted the name Impressionists because they felt it adequately conveyed what they were trying to do. They weren't interested in creating the reality or some sort of historical allegory. They wanted to capture the way that things felt to them, their impression of events. Like most young artists, they spent a good deal of time hanging out and talking with their fellow artists about the things that they liked and didn't like. And one group of people that Manet hung out with were called the Symbolists. These guys were poets, and they were led by one Stéphane Mellarmé. Mellarmé, as the leader of the Symbolists, felt that poetry also needed to be brought into the new century. Poetry up to this point had been much like romantic painting. It had been filled with references to literature and all sorts of other things that he felt were removing it from its true meaning. Mallarmé said that symbolist poetry needed to follow certain rules. One of these rules was indirect communication. Rather than stating things plainly, the symbolists would find symbolic objects to represent them. So instead of talking about something being tranquil and calm, they would talk about water. Instead of talking about anger or rage or passion, they would talk about fire. The symbolists believed that poetry should be self-contained and self-justified. It didn't need to refer to any sort of literary works outside of itself. And they also believed that poetry should be somewhat vague and let the listener find what they wanted to find in the inner meanings of the poetry. Another friend of Stephen Mallarmé and the symbolists and the Impressionist painters was a young composer named Claude Debussy. Claude Debussy was born in 1862. His father wanted him to be a sailor, but his prodigious musical talents meant that he ended up entering the musical conservatory at age 11, where he scandalized the faculty and fellow students alike with his complete disregard for the musical rules of the day. One famous exchange with one of his instructors went something like this. Well, if you don't observe the traditional rules of harmony, what rules do you observe then? My own pleasure. That's all very well, provided that you're a genius. He was. At the age of 18, he was hired to be the house piano player for the patroness of Tchaikovsky. At the age of 22, a cantata of his won the Prix de Rome, which was a very special prize that basically meant he got to go to Rome and live all expenses paid for three years, and all he had to do was write one piece a year. Debussy hated Italy. When he submitted his first piece, his instructors wrote, at present, Monsieur Debussy seems to be afflicted with a desire to write music that is bizarre, incomprehensible, and impossible to execute. When he submitted his third piece, The Blessed Demoiselle, it was labeled Impressionism by one of his professors who wrote, It is much to be desired that he beware of this vague Impressionism, which is one of the most dangerous enemies of artistic truth. Debussy hated being labeled an Impressionist, but it stuck. For Debussy, like the symbolists, art was supposed to be sensuous, not intellectual. It was all about 
finding pleasure on the surface instead of searching for some deeper literary meaning. And Debussy was becoming dissatisfied with music the way it was. He was growing tired of the traditional structures that he'd been forced to learn and use over and over again. He was tired of normal tonal emphasis and began to explore different scales, like the whole tone scale and the pentatonic scale. He continued using unorthodox harmonizations, building up big chords and moving them up and down in his music, instead of harmonizing them up properly. And something else had been bothering Debussy for quite some time. He had been sitting there with his friend Eric Satie, thinking about the great composers as he had been taught. Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Wagner. There were lots of Austrians and Germans, but there were no great French composers. And as he chatted with his friend Satie, Satie uttered one of his famous quotes to Debussy where he said, we should have our own music, and preferably without sauerkraut. Where was uniquely French music? Debussy wanted the French to be French, not pale imitations of German. He wanted their music to be romantic and clear and free from all of the, the German bombast and ideology. Debussy was also sick of Wagner, of Wagner's epic ring cycle, he said, how tedious become these people in furs and horns after four nights, especially when night after night you have to hear the same thing over and over. In 1894, at the age of 32, he produced his first mature piece based on a poem by his friend Stephen Mallarmé. It was called The Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn. And in this piece, Debussy's true impressionist style emerges for us for the first time, fully formed. He had also been working on a piece for a long time that his friend Eric Satie had suggested. He had taken a symbolist play and had turned it into an opera, a true impressionist opera labeled Pelias et Melisande. He debuted Pelias et Melisande April 30th, 1902. The critics hated it. Their initial dislike of his music soon passed, however, and eventually impressionism spread throughout Europe and then throughout the world. Debussy now found himself the leader of Debussyism, complete with fawning sycophants and slavish imitators. Debussy himself became something of a music critic and wrote savage reviews of these people. Impressionism was everywhere. Debussy had arrived. He was on top, and he had won. Debussy died of cancer in March of 1918 as German bombs pounded his beloved city of Paris. His music doesn't sound so incredibly radical today, but it was startlingly original in its day.